Our presenter tonight is uh, Lane Kaltfleisch. She has a master's in education and a PhD and likes to go by Dr. K apparently. And she is the CEO of 2E Consultants, a practice providing assessment and coaching services for adults, children, and families. Tonight's talk uh, is entitled Teaching to Everyone's Potential. This talk extends findings and coaching strategies from Dr. K's reaching, recent book, Teaching to Every Kid's Potential, Simple Neuroscience Lessons to Liberate Learners. And it focuses on neuros, neurodiverse patterns of brain function and how mental illness influences learning and creativity. And one thing I also found in Dr. K's Vita was that she has provided free staff development to early childhood professionals across the states of New Mexico and Virginia since March 2021 through the New Mexico Association for the Education of Young Children. And so with that, uh, thank you, Dr. K, for joining us tonight and presenting for us, and we will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Craig, Jessica, Betty, Rock. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you, and we'll get started. Okay. All right. So, I yes, I'm talking to you tonight about a part of my book that has children in the title, but the information that's in the book is for everybody. Um, and so what I'm going to teach you tonight comes from that book, but it applies to you because the book is four chapters that overturn some misunderstandings that we have about ourselves as learners. And it's okay that we've misunderstood ourselves because we haven't had neuroimaging technology long enough to sort everything out about how we learn and create. And so I'm gonna be giving you a series of teachings tonight focusing on unmasking and mental health. And as Craig said, I go by Dr. K in the office. I'm an educational psychologist and a cognitive neuroscientist. The informal way I describe my job is that I fit learning from the inside out to the outside in because it's don't fit the environment that you have stress, right? And so what I engage in is a process of fitting for families, children, and even organizations um, in staff developments and trainings so that people get sharper about learning to unmask behavior, not only in people that they're working with or coaching, mentoring, or guiding, but also in ourselves. So a little bit about me. This is a page um, that kind of tells you how I tick. This is, this is how I look at the world. Leadership isn't about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in your charge. And of course, in Northern New Mexico, and as a native myself, there's a high priority on seed preservation, land preservation, language, um, and particularly this time of the year, growing, growing flowers, growing crops. And I always tell people, you're tending your crops and your gardens, and I tend to children, and I tend to families. That's, that's what I help grow. <laughs> Um, and then in terms of everyday functioning, I love how Mary Oliver puts it, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And as a little uh, prequel to talking about unmasking, I found this quote when I was writing the book, and I love this, because the Maori tribe in New Zealand their word for autism is Takawatonga, and it means in their own time and space. And when I found that saying, I thought, what if the world understood autism the way the Maori think about it? It would change our ability to serve and to be empathetic and to really unmask and understand what we're truly seeing in a brain with autism, okay? So I'm going to play you a little snip of an interview um, that came from the Arrowhead Indian Business Enterprise Center in Las Cruces. And this is a very short thumbnail sketch of the four chapters of the book, what I call neur the, the neural imperatives. Um, because when I was writing this book, 
I was talking with my editor one day and I said, you know, people don't need to understand everything about a brain, but it would be nice if a brain could talk, what would it say to us about how it needs to be tended? What will make a brain well? And my answer to that were the four chapters. The brain says, let's be flexible. Help me be ready. Help me understand that even in moments of trauma and stress, that I'm not alone. I'm connected mm -hmm. and, and unmask. Help me understand what it what I'm really seeing and feeling, maybe in myself and maybe in somebody else. So my book follows certain paradoxes about how our brains learn and highlights certain biases that keep us from recognizing learning potential in our children. For example, in chapter one, we look at distraction, which is typically a negative quality in learning, but it can actually be used strategically to enhance memory development. In chapter two on readiness, we look at behaviors like mind wandering, off task behavior and daydreaming. Again, those are typically villains in the learning process, but what we're learning from neuroscience is that those processes are vital to how our brains and our bodies really learn. In chapter three on connection enhances and takes that a step further so that we look at teamwork and collaboration from a brain's point of view to optimize social learning and learning in the service of something greater than yourself. And finally, in chapter four, we look at the concept of masking, which is when one ability or disability covers another skill that's still emerging and developing. And so we often misinterpret what we're seeing in the learning moment. So those four neurological imperatives, flexibility, your ability to pivot, to move between one thing and another. And some people do that more comfortably than others for many reasons. Readiness is being slightly more excited than scared. Notice that scared is still in, in the equation or stress is still in the equation or anxiety because those are, they can also be helpers as long as there's the right combination of motivation and anxiety. So that's what readiness is. And then being connected, even when you think you're not, because the first thing trauma does is trick, it tricks you into thinking you're alone. And, and a lot of people get stuck in a moment like that. So being able to realize that you're in connect, in connection and in community, even when you feel like you're not. And then masking is what I colloquially call peeling the onion upon the brain. What's really going on in front of you for yourself or someone else. And so on a daily practice of this fitting process, I have this saying that science is the story of the grand mean and the group average, but people are individuals. And every time a neuroscience study comes out, we get very excited about that little that little new nugget of found knowledge about ourselves. And what it's important to remember is that scientific studies to have validity and reliability have a lot of people in them. And that a lot of times the individual differences in those people fall away in the service of that grand mean and group average. But if you are a person uh, seeking service, you're not dragging a grand mean around with you. You're the individual. And so what I do every day is cross that bridge between science and practice to be able to responsibly find the science on behalf of the, the individual. And so in, in this habit breaking of understanding that distraction can actually be a good thing for us, that mind wandering can be a good thing for us, that we're connected even when we think we aren't, and that there are ways of understanding disability and mental health that, that can be positive. We're in this moment of unlearning certain things. And we're in need of what, what I like to call positive peace. And positive peace is my term. This term comes from the letter from the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King. And in that letter, he distinguished between negative peace and positive peace. And negative peace is something that we're more familiar with on a daily basis. 
negative piece is the next thing that's going to come along to disrupt your day. Um, you know, it might be quiet right at this minute, but something's going to come along to change that. And the pandemic was certainly a huge global moment of negative peace. But what we need is positive peace, and that's the presence of justice. And so, you know, my mission in sharing this information and talking with you guys, with NAMI, talking with the early childhood community, talking with the Anna Age Aid Institute and all of the groups in New Mexico that have allowed me to share this message. Um, it's important. I want people to understand what I've learned and what I know in this journey between science and practice. And as a psychologist and a neuroscientist, the outside in and the inside out, because it's going to enhance life quality. And if everyone understood these things and could take them to heart and mind, we'd be living in a different spot, I think. And so I challenge you tonight as the listener, who are you as a learner, a problem solver, and a creator? Because if you can answer those questions for yourself and understand the, the, your own qualities, the, the strengths that you bring to those, those kinds of activities, then you can learn to see them in somebody else. And empathy is a huge part of extending what you think about yourself and how you function and being able to understand someone else's position. And so throughout the talk, every once in a while, I'm going to show you an image because I'm talking about a lot of terminology and information in a fairly short period of time. And I know that you're not going to be listening the whole time. It, the brain doesn't do that. It's impossible. So this is a bit of a palate cleanser for your brain and your mind to be able to have things, these thoughts in the background about what I'm saying, but also just to kind of give you a break, give you a moment of beauty and, and a chance to take a breath. So unmasking is learning to identify the root of a person's behavior and performance issues. And this is a this is a brief list of examples of unmasking. So behavior can mask talent. I have worked with people who have a really hard time with self-management. They're not appropriate in a social environment or in a learning environment. And yet their brains are wildly creative and wildly smart. And that's one way behavior can mask that really exceptional talent or creativity that somebody has. Talent can mask effort, right? If you're a morning person, no matter what is ailing you, but you're a morning person, th those first few hours of the day are really critical for you. You're, you're doing great. But, you know, fast forward to four o'clock in the afternoon at the end of a long day, you might be running out of gas. People that take psychiatric medications that wash out, right? They have a sweet spot somewhere in the middle of the day. The end of the day is harder, right? And if you're interacting with people when you're feeling really strong, then that masks difficulties that you may carry with you all the time. And that may surface later in the privacy of your home. Disability can mask talent. I spend a lot of time with people, both adults and children, who have different learning disabilities and learning disability, mostly from the outside in, people are underestimated in what they can do. And so people have to try that much harder to be able to show, figure out where they're talented and show where they're talented. But along the way, they're going to be underestimated and misunderstood in certain moments. In clinical diagnoses, ADHD-like behavior has five potential possibilities of origin. And when I shared this with a middle schoolers and high schoolers this weekend, they all sat up a little taller in their seats because they there were you know several kids who were who were thinking, oh, finally somebody sees and understands. But you know, five different ways, hyperactivity with five different routes, you could have a very bright person who is very bored and is having a hard time attending. 
You could have somebody that didn't get enough sleep or hasn't been getting enough rest, maybe for a physical reason. You could have somebody who's experiencing emotional trauma that can, that can manifest as hyperactivity. You can have someone who legitimately has low dopamine synthesis in their brain, which is really the, the biological root of what ADHD is. And then finally, what's my fifth? I'm losing my train of thought. Boredom, the real deal. Yeah, so I'm missing number five at the moment. It'll come back probably when I'm down at the bottom of the slide. But my point is that is there are a lot of different things that contribute to ADHD that three out of four won't, won't be ADHD. When I see clusters of diagnoses, when I'm doing a psychoeducational evaluation, kids that are escalated on anxiety, maybe OCD, depression, mild thought problems, when I see a list that's pretty long in one person, especially if they're a young person, I think, do they really have all those diagnoses? And a lot of times there are clusters that suggest autism or clusters of diagnoses that suggest one condition, not five separate. And so that's the one that I really try to keep an eye on because when you see those kinds of interpretations, in people's lives, that's it's a lot for somebody to carry. And it's very liberating when you can say to them, you know, guess what? Yeah, you've got these clusters of behaviors and diagnoses that have followed you, but really it kind of all boils down to this one. This is the root of it. And when I can provide that kind of clarity to somebody, it lightens their load significantly and it leads to a paradigm shift that then makes coaching other behaviors and skills possible. And then finally, on, on the bottom of the page, oppositional defiance. Again, in, in young people, I always think, are they organically made to be oppositional or did they learn it? Because there's a heavy nature-nurture component. So this kind of hints at what I mean by unmasking, and it hints at why it is so important that we really get better at understanding ourselves and people that we work with, teach, coach, tend. Here are our three more examples. Dyslexia. I had a young person and her mother said the lights are out. She's a child actress. She's effervescent. She floats. But ever since she learned she has a learning disability, she has dyslexia, the lights have gone out. And the, the moment I spent with her now is animated for everybody that I can tell and explain it to. And I said to her, I said, your dyslexia, I said, hold up your pinky. And I said, your pinky finger now isn't very big, is it? And I said, put that pinky fingernail above your ear. And I said, the piece of your brain that's different is smaller than the size of your pinky fingernail. And it's right above the tip of your ear, somewhere in that region. And in brain development, you have gyri, these long bands you know, that, that make up our brain. And I said, all it is is those two gyri that are typically neighbors, they just got fused together a tiny bit at the end. And she said, oh, Dr. K, I have a webbed toe in my brain. And I said, exactly. <laughs> and I have told that story to as many people as I can ever since that moment, because her mother called me and said, the lights are back on. <laughs> I don't know what you said to her, but the lights are back on. Thank you so much. Autism is just the sensory cortex trying to do the job of the whole brain. Okay. So when someone is born with, with the genetic components of autism and they, and those switches turn on in infancy, the sensory cortex says, Hey, I'm kind of the boss of the brain right now. Right. And at the beginning of our lives, we need swaddling. We need physical contact. We need feeding. We are highly sensory. We have no language. 
We don't have skills yet. We don't even have mobility. And so the sensory cortex says, aha, I'm the boss. And then as a person grows, of course, functions move into other regions of the brain and different regions of the brain connect. Only in a person with autism, that sensory cortex hangs on for just a smidge longer and says, oh, no, that function that should go up front into the frontal lobes to help this person pay attention. Oh, no, I've totally got that. I'm going to hang on to that. And so this is the most neutral definition of autism that I know. And this came from neuroimaging work that I did in collaboration with Georgetown and Johns Hopkins. And time and again, it is, if you follow brain development, and I'm going to share some more fine grained details with you in a moment or two, but the sensory cortex leads life and leads development. And in autism, it's just the sensory cortex hanging on to everything for just a little bit longer. Because when development capitulates and says, well, these pathways have to grow into the brain, so it becomes interconnected. They do, only they show up in the same neighborhood, but at a slightly different address, which is what leads to some of the, the splinter skills in autism, the, the beautiful talents for music and mathematics, but also leads to sensory overload. Because if the sensory part of the brain is trying to do the whole job, and it's only a piece, ima imagine the stock. I always think of Jack and the Beanstalk. There goes the stock. All of that input is going into the sensory cortex and it's narrow because it's only a part of the brain. And so of course it overloads, right? And you think, well, yeah, that makes total sense. And that's all, that's what autism is, plain and simple. ADHD, it just means that you have a brain that sees connections among things that are farther away. And so, but you see them quickly, as quickly as similarities that are close for most people. And that's a skill and that's a talent. So Richard Wagamese, he's an Ojibwe storyteller, a man from my tribe. And I, I didn't know him before he passed, but this comes from a book, this page that he wrote. And it says, find an insight that heals. And so these three moments are moments that I had with individual people that I now share with as many people as I can, because if the world of mental health and, and learning disabilities understood these things, like I understand these things and the way that people that I have helped in my practice, the world would be a different place and people's minds and hearts could be better. So unmasking on the fly, you think, all right, Dr. K, you just showed me this huge, this huge list of examples of unmasking. It, once the talk is over, how do I do this for myself? How do I do it for somebody else? Okay. So two questions. This is all you have to remember. You know, if you enjoy the talk, great. You don't have to remember the whole thing, but remember these two questions, because this is what it all boils down to in practice, in community, in relationship with someone. Two questions when somebody is struggling. The first is, do they, they have the mindset? Do they have the skill? Do they have the knowledge inside of them already? But there's something about the fit between their insides and their outsides that doesn't match. And so if they know it, but they can't show it, then you're trying to adjust the environment. You're trying to make them more comfortable at, or at ease. You're trying to shift something that creates that match. Or do they not have the knowledge, the mindset, or the skill? In which case they need to be taught or trained. So the example I like to use for this is math anxiety, right? We all, we all learned math in our education some better than others, some like it, some don't. But have you been in that situation where you better do some math and the timer is on and you know it, but you can't show it? Math anxiety is like a classic example. And But if I put a piece of trigonometry in front of you and you never learn trig, 
you need to be taught or trained. I need to show you how to do that trig problem. So every moment of distress or stress or being stuck boils down to one of these two moments, one of these two states. And if you're in the helping, if you're if you're in the helping position, it always boils down to one of these two things. Are you going to make them comfortable, shift something around them to help them demonstrate, to help them shift, to help them move? Or is there something that they need to learn and you're, you can help train or coach that? Because you can't learn to unmask without that empathy. And so this is why I'm going through a lot of slides to understand ways that we can learn to unmask. So now I'm going to peel the onion on the brain, okay? We're going to peel the body from the brain, processes underneath things that we do effortfully, the executive functions that help us do things that we intend to do. And we'll talk a little bit about those villains, distraction and mind wandering. So the first thing is why is it so hard when somebody is in a moment of trauma or discomfort? stress or distress. Well, the brain naturally finds fairness rewarding at a fundamental level. So when we are born back to being an infant, we're born with the ability to detect agency and imbalances of power. So this has to do with a social dynamic in the room. Who's who and who's what? Who's in charge? Who's a follower? Auditory inconsistencies in speech and language. Infants can hear subtleties in language that adult ears cannot. And finally, deception. And deception is so complicated. Human neuroscience has been trying to measure it for ages. And we can't get it right. My personal thought about it is because it's a state of mind. It's not a process, you know. Putting someone in an MRI scanner and say lie doesn't get the job done because it has to do with a state of mind. But as babies, we are born with the finesse to be able to intuit these kinds of things in a social environment. At eight months of age, we can see these things non-verbally. A baby notices who's always giving them food, who's always giving them comfort. At three years of age, we can pick up on those same things in verbal exchanges. So it's really important when you're either in a helping position or thinking about yourself. People get stuck in moments of injustice, comparing this is the way it should be versus this is the way it is. And if you understand that there's a basic premise in our neurology for feeling that way, then maybe we can be lighter in the moment and say, okay, this is just my brain being a brain. And then it becomes easier to shift or move, move forward. Unmasking the brain from the body. So when we measure the brain doing things, I could say, okay, everybody, let's add two plus two. Two plus two is four. That batter. He's hitting the ball. He just added two plus two plus two plus two is four. And in the normal sequence of events that we anticipate, the batter hits the ball, the crowd goes wild, and the team is successfully winning the game, right? That's a natural sequence of events. Only in our brains, the parts of our brains that act, so two plus two is four, happens up here, right, right here. It's called the hips, the horizontal inferior parietal sulcus. And four plus four, two plus two equals four. That happens right here. Only the batter hits the ball, two plus two equals four. And then there's this very long pause. And it's so long, everybody's, the crowd left the station. Now there's just a ghost in the audience. And then you hear this incredible cheer. So when you do something in the brain, your behavior does it. But that physical part of the brain 
isn't activated until two to 16 seconds after you do it. That can cause problems with people understanding and misunderstanding information coming at them, right? You think, oh, well, two plus two is four. We can move on. And we go, we go on down the line and doing our math. But your brain is behind. So there's this time lag issue that people don't understand. It happens naturally between the brain and the body. And in mental health and disability, the real piece that's important here is something called low registration. And low registration is measured in sensory processing. And low registration means a person is in a moment having a very big emotional response, maybe being overloaded. And so they're absorbing all of that, but their own response to it doesn't come out until much later. And usually it comes out way after there's that moment has closed. And it comes out an hour later, a day later, a week later. And you think, where did that come from? That doesn't fit the moment. And you may experience this yourself and think, why am I, why am I feeling so emotional today? Why am I having a day where I am so stirred up? And yet everything around me is, is placid and calm. Well, that that's what low registration is. It's, it's, the expression of something sensory or emotional coming out long after that moment has passed. So in my mind, this is a big one because we misunderstand this and people chide themselves about that mismatch, not knowing that it can be a natural part of how our brains and our bodies are functioning. So I said, this before we are sensory beings first and you notice these three curves for sensory processing language processing and higher cognitive functioning like learning and creativity and this timeline doesn't even start at birth it starts in in gestation and that last trimester is when all of these processes get started and get loaded up and what eventually blossoms into our brain but sensation comes first, and that's when I was talking about autism previously, being the sensory cortex trying to do everything. This is the basis for that, because we are all sensory first in the beginning of our life. For autism, it just hangs on a little bit longer. So appreciating that there are these waves of the way our brain develops helps unpack a little bit about the timing that happens in mental illness when things are off and things don't fit together. It isn't just cognitive, something cognitive happening. There are physical processes underneath that may be responding or may be um, imparted a little bit differently in that person's neurology. If that isn't enough, then we have cognition and, and emotions. And we think, well, our brain is our thinking organ. So, you know, we're, we're learning, we're growing every day, and the feelings are the fluffy stuff around. No, it's actually the opposite. The feelings are the meat. And we have our feelings first, and then all the cognitive development happens to catch up with the feeling. And if you don't know that, that is literally, it's an inverse of what you would think happens. And yet when you think about different ways of being, neurodivergence, mental illness, mental health, there are these all of these pieces that have to line up and fit in order for somebody to feel and be well in a moment. But so emotion is strong and it's strong because these little pieces where these red arrows are in this brain scan, they're about the size of an almond. You have the amygdala, and that's the piece, that's fight or flight. That's the piece that generates all of the adrenaline and the cortisol that makes us really unhappy when we're stressed or anxious. And once it's on, it's very hard to turn off because it likes what it does. It loves its job in the brain. 
So that drives emotional response. And that's what makes emotion so powerful in learning, both for better and worse. But all the cognitive stuff comes later, and especially in the frontal lobes of the brain, where our executive functions, the things that help us live a proper adult life, right? Our ability to manage ourselves and our ability to manage everything else. So things like inhibition and emotional control or working memory or task organization. And those skills are not fully physically mature until around the age of 25. So if you are in community with somebody who's under the age of 25 and they are neurodivergent, there are a lot of processes. These are the processes all trying to line up and coordinate to, to make a healthy life. And we know that mental illness has a genetic basis, that there are certain systems that don't line up. I've been using autism as the biggest example of that pregnant pause in development where the sensory cortex hangs on to everything. But I'm, I hope as I'm speaking, you're appreciating the complexity of what happens underneath a moment of doing something. So I want you to think about this because our brains, we're used to thinking about our brains as the thing that does things for us, that problem solves, that allows us to be creative in great moments. But it really isn't the thinking organ that happens to feel. It's the feeling organ that thinks. And again, if you kind of flip that expectation that the thinking and the things we do are the meat and the motivation and emotion around are kind of the fluffy stuff, it's actually the inverse. And so this is a big one in helping people unmask themselves and notice what's going on for other people. So I've been talking about the executive functions a moment ago, and there are eight or nine skills in the brain, but they fall into those two containers of managing yourself and managing everything else. When I talk with people about these skills, I don't talk about weaknesses if a person is under 25, because if something is growing, growing, growing up like a seed until the age of 25, in my mind, it is pure potential. And it may be behind or in relation to other skills that it's not the strongest, but we talk about it as a seedling skill, not a weakness, because that, again, is a paradigm shift that helps someone not be stuck in their disability, in their diagnoses. It, it's liberating because it says, wait, there's a chance. There's, there's a chance. Things are changing. Things are changing in my body and in my mind. And this is, in general, this is how executive functions kind of fall into the other three principles, the neurological imperatives for flexibility, readiness, and connection. Flexibility is dependent on your ability to shift and your working memory, grabbing pieces of information to problem solve. Your readiness, being more excited than scared, has to do with your emotional control and your ability to be self-motivated and connection, even reminding yourself that you're not alone when trauma is trying to trick you into thinking that you are, is another aspect of self-management. So I want to leave you with one teaching. This is my dog River chasing the sunset one particular evening. All right. So you've got an almond in your right hand and two cherries in your left, okay? And the almond corresponds to the amygdala, the little yellow piece on this brain schematic. And the cherries correspond to these two little blue pieces behind the yellow one, and they're called the nucleus accumbens. And the amygdala, as we know, squirts out adrenaline and cortisol when we're stressed, makes us very stuck, right? Stress and distress. The nucleus accumbens squirts out 
medicines like oxytocin, which helps us remember we're in community and feel that feeling of being connected. Dopamine, which allows us to focus and get motivated and excited about something in particular. And notice there are two nucleus accumbens to one amygdala. Those are great odds, right? So if you're holding an almond in your right hand for the amygdala and two cherries in your left, and you're opening and closing your right hand on the almond, because this is sending a signal to your brain, hey, there's something I wanna reinforce with myself here, okay? That almond, the amygdala is as big as this almond. It's only a piece of me. It's a powerful piece, but I am more than this amygdala. This is not me. I'm, oh, I'm stressed, but look, I can hold that piece in my hand. And it gives you that moment of, oh, no, it's not really me. It's trying to trick me into thinking it is, but it really isn't. And then the cherries, two to one. These are great odds. I've got two neurochemicals in my brain to help me feel motivated, passionate, and well, and connected to this one over here, which is very small and mighty, but it's not me. It's not the whole of me. And it isn't even more than the good medicines that my brain can give me too. So the next time you feel stuck or someone in your life does, you might teach them almonds and cherries and just getting the brain thinking about this may disrupt the stress or the distress and allow you to take a breath and move on. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Lane. That was another excellent um, presentation that just reminds me of how much I love hearing you talk. Um, so I, I don't mind starting off with a question. Um, when you say that trauma tricks you into thinking that you're alone, can you explain a little bit more about how that works? Sure. So when you notice in this particular schematic, the hippocampus, which is in red, which is symbolized over here by seahorse because hippocampus is Greek for little horse. And that's the piece of the brain that takes in new learning. And when you are being challenged to recall it, it comes back out. And notice how proximate all these pieces are together, right? The amygdala is right next to the hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens is somewhere behind. So they're all nested together, which is why we're so vulnerable to too much stress because when it goes out, it literally floods the hippocampus kind of like an adrenaline moat. And when that moat is around the castle, nothing goes out, right? So what you know and do can't come out. And what's out there in the world for you that might be really healthy and good can't come in. And, you know, ways that you make the moat subside, physical exercise, being in community with someone you know and trust, rebuilding that sense of connection to emotional safety. Um, but trauma, which escalates cortisol and adrenaline, can make you stuck. People cannot move. They freeze in that state. And that's why it's, it, that's why it's such a powerful part of our bodies and our brains. But the mindset that that neurobiology brings is the mindset of feeling stuck. And when people feel stuck a lot, it, it takes them from understanding that they might be in community or in relationship because to them, they are literally in a moment that they cannot move from without help and intervention. Okay, so when you say the brain is um, a feeling organ that thinks, like the way I was trying to explain it, so it's like when you walk into a room, maybe you're feeling it first, you're getting an impression and that comes first. And then and then later your brain comes in and tries to make sense of what's going on. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, that's that's a great way to think about it. It's, it's a giant antenna. Um, a biological example is your skin. Your skin is the biggest nucleus of your brain. Um, when we're... Again, back into gestation, when you have that tiny little zygote 
and it differentiates, you know, it looks like, like a leaf. And on one side of that leaf are your lungs and your stomach and all of your like torso or gut organs. But on the other side are your hair, your fingernails, your teeth, and your brain. So your hair, your fingernails, your teeth, and your brain, this is the biggest nucleus of the brain because it, from the very beginning, it's like our outsides are uniquely and tied and our antenna for the brain. So I don't know. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's really fascinating. (laughs) Maybe maybe think of the, um, of the saying, don't uh, judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the book first right yeah Yeah. then all these layers peeling the onion you know the the brain showing up the function later than than the doing of it and the timing issues with with a you know a body that's typical or normal but when you get into mental health and neurodivergence those timing systems are even more delicate and are completely different in some cases so it's we, I think we would give each other a lot more grace if we understood ourselves this way. Yeah. I'll never think of, I'll, I'll always think of almonds and cherries now in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, yeah. that actually came up. I was doing, um, I was doing a retreat with veterans at Northern New Mexico college and it was day two. And this, this was a spontaneous thing that came up with that group of trying to figure out something physical that they could do to disrupt a bad feeling and almonds and cherries was born. (laughs) So. Loved your photography. Thanks. That's all around uh, Abiquiu, right? Yeah. I took these in my neighborhood. Yeah. That's part of my. Dr. K for your uh, fascinating presentation. I was just wondering when I saw this slide about disrupting disrupting negative emotions and heard you explain about it, um, to what extent do the classic mindfulness practices like deep breathing techniques and meditation and things like yoga, to what extent do they play a role in sort of what, what you're talking about with respect to disrupting negative emotions? Oh, they play a huge role. Um, we, you know, we know through neuroimaging and through practice that These are ways of, again, giving people tools to disrupt and interrupt moments where they might be stuck and, you know, stuck from emotion, strong emotion, or stuck in mental illness. But all of these practices, um, we know, are good medicine. And I know in work in schools, there are schools now that are making wellness rooms and staffing them with yoga, yoga instructors and people yeah. that train mindfulness. So it, it's a big deal. I mean, if we really wholesale begin to integrate strategies like this into typical settings where people learn and develop, it's going to shut mental illness because people are going to get those skills in childhood before something could take hold. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, absolutely. What about that con- Go ahead. Go ahead, Betty. No, I was just going to see if anybody else had a comment or question, and it sounds like you do. Well, when you brought up the meditation and yoga, I started thinking about the br- breathing exercises. A lot of times, you know, people are told if they have anxiety or um, stress to do deep breathing. And I'm wondering, is that is the breathing part of it, is it the actual physical oxygen issue, or is it the meditative part of breathing, um, you know, deep breathing and counting your breaths and, you know, those kind of techniques. What is it that is both helping? It's both. Yeah. Mm. Because if you're intentionally moving oxygen into your body in different ways and you are, you know, in the moment of I'm doing this on purpose for a reason, you know, it coalesces every, all of your resources to the same in different ways. I'd like to suggest that it also breaks a bad pattern, such as so a lot of trauma response, that freeze response, 
going into that stuck mode and when your your um your body is physically attuned or habituated to responding in that way to stress to any kind of stress that um sorry i think it's i've had to work so you're not breathing is what i'm trying to say and that whole breaking that cycle physically does something too is what i'm trying to say does that make sense? absolutely yes you got it you got it like literally these are ways to interrupt ourselves on a very fundamental level and you know if everyone had this toolkit from the beginning oh that would be we'd be living in a different world and yeah. But this is why I'm saying, how fast can I tell this to people? How how much how well can I share this uh, quickly? <laughs> because I want people to have the relief that I've seen people have in these moments where where these things were developed and born. <laughs> sure. Um, I wanted okay. to share, yeah, sorry, a moment like that. I recently had an experience with my brother where um, we shared a hotel room. And he likes the heat up to like 90 degrees and he likes what he calls white noise, which is noise back TV. I like the heat to 69 and I like silence. And we both felt like the other person was trying to torture them on purpose. And <laughs> that, you know, and, and now, and we couldn't figure it out. And the next morning, you know, we both realized no, neither one was trying to do anything, you know, but logically it's like we just couldn't couldn't get there in the moment. Right. And the way you described it just explains explains that to me so much because you know I can understand, you know, why why did this turn into a fight? You know, neither person was trying to inflict harm on the other, but right. that just felt it was like all feelings and you know, and you're trying to get some sleep and so you I finally have some clarity on that situation. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Good. Well, it'll happen again, Jess, but now you can have a different outcome next time. <laughs> we got that learning, learning, learning. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, does anyone else have a final question or comment out in, in the uh, Zoom land? Um, not seeing any. Uh, thank you again, Lane, for your presentation. It was fascinating.